Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to VUX World. I'm your host, Kane Sims, and I am delighted to get into today's conversation with Aisha Salim uh, of Instacart, conversation design manager of Instacart. We're going to be talking all about how Instacart is using conversational AI, some conversation design best practice, and a whole lot more, I'm sure. Uh, we're dying to get into that. But first, we, before we do, let's first give a shout out to our presenting sponsor, DeepGram. DeepGram is automatic speech recognition technology and one of the best in the business. If you are looking for speech recognition technology to fuel and power your voice assistants and voice bots, or even any other use cases that you might need transcription for, think about call recordings and transcribing things like meetings and all that kind of stuff. DeepGram is literally one of the best in the business. It's incredibly cost effective. It is incredibly quick, which is imperative when you're creating conversational experiences. You don't want to wait five minutes for the thing to be able to understand you and respond back. And crucially, which is what I've, I've been talking about this quite a lot recently, and last uh, the last episode of the podcast, we spoke to Rob Cunningham, who's the Innovation Manager of NL, LNER, and he explained how he, when he implemented a, a digital avatar in Newcastle train station, had to train the ASR, Automatic Speech Recognition, to be able to cope with different accents, different dialects and things like that. This is one of the things that not many organizations do when they create voice capabilities. They don't tend to retrain their automatic speech recognition to be able to understand the dialect of the people that are speaking to it, the type of uh, jargon or colloquialisms or product types that you have, you know, industry-specific jargon. You can retrain your speech recognition models to increase the accuracy based on your specific use cases. That then gives your NLU greater accuracy, which means that your bot and your and has a greater chance of understanding people. That is what Deep Ground enable you to do. And not all speech recognition providers enable you to do that. So please do check out deepgram.com forward slash VUX world if you would like to learn more. That is deepgram.com forward slash VUX world. Thank you, Deep Graham, for presenting VUX World. And if you're not subscribed to VUX World yet, please do so. It is vux.world forward slash subscribe. You'll get all of the invites to events that we have like this with industry experts like Aisha, who we're going to get uh, into a conversation with in just a moment. Uh, and you'll get all of the summaries, all of the articles that we publish, and also summaries of insights and news that are happening within the industry on a weekly basis. That's vux.world forward slash subscribe now. Without further ado, please welcome Aisha Salim, Conversation Design Manager at Instacart. Aisha, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. No worries. Thank you for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, well, well, uh, well, looking forward to this one. So thank you for spending the time with us. Yeah, me too. I'm excited. Cool, cool. Uh, so it's an interesting one, Instacart. Uh, it doesn't exist in the UK, but we do have very similar services. Um Hello Fresh is one, uh, Gusto is one. So for those in the UK, you might start to get familiar with what Instacart is. From the people in Europe, Asia, South America, stuff like that, Aisha, I wonder if you can give us, first of all, a bit of an insight into what Instacart is and tell us also a little bit about yourself as well. Yeah, for sure. So let's start with Instacart. So Instacart started as a delivery service, which obviously was so important during the pandemic. Um, essentially, we we're able to deliver any grocery to anyone in the United States and now Canada as well um, in a very, very short amount of time. Um, we have been expanding tremendously in the last year. Um, so now we're doing all sorts of deliveries. We can do flowers, we can do pet supplies. Um, we can even do makeup, which is super clutch for the people that are Sephora fans. Um, but the the business model is essentially um, a delivery system. So I'm not sure if the UK has um, like an Uber Eats or a, a Postmates or um, anything like that, but very similar to that, but just a broader scope in what we can deliver. Mm, interesting, interesting. So it's it sounds yeah, it sounds like very much like an Uber Eats or uh, Deliveroo, which I thought Deliveroo was everywhere, but apparently it's not. I don't think Deliveroo exists in the US, does it? Yeah, I haven't. No, I have not heard of that one. Right. It's very similar. Yeah. Um, it's weird because I thought Deliveroo was everywhere. And then I moved uh, 250 miles north and Deliveroo just doesn't exist around here. You just can't get anything uh -huh. for the love of money. Um, but yeah, so that's interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll maybe get into that and we'll, we'll, we can kind of uh, discuss that a bit more. But first, tell, tell us a bit about yourself. So you've been working uh, in the conversational AI space for quite a while. I'm looking at your LinkedIn here. You've got experience at Clink, which is a... Um, 
uh, a decent company, very innovative. Uh, we've had Jason Mars <laughs> on, on the show in the past, which is really good. Uh, so, yeah, tell us, tell us a bit about yourself and about your experience and how you got in- interested in conversational AI. Yeah, for sure. So I actually stumbled into conversational AI, to be completely honest. Um, I was interning at a company called General Electric, um, and I was building Alexa skills and voice assistants, um, working with Dialogflow, even before it was called Dialogflow. I think at that point it was API.ai. Um, absolutely loved it. thought it was an, an amazing field. Um, got to do a little bit on the development side, then moved over to the design side. Um, there wasn't really a role like conversation designer. Um, so when I was at Slink, I was actually doing like user research and a lot of what ended up being conversation design um, on different platforms and different technologies. Um, and then I actually was hired in as Rocket Mortgage's first conversation designer, even before they knew what that was. Um, I really helped build that role. Um, and in that in that field, the mortgage industry, which I think is is very unique to the United States as well. Um, I was building voice assistants and chatbots that chatbots that helped people. Um, like qualify for a mortgage, helped people through the entire mortgage journey. The mortgage journey is incredibly complicated and to be frank, like a pain in the ass. Um, so chatbots and voice assistants were definitely very helpful there. Um, built that um, built that practice up at Rocket Mortgage and I just recently left um, to join Instacart as a conversation design manager. I have been here since February and I'm loving it. Nice. I can imagine mortgages being particularly difficult because it's one of those industries where a lot of knowledge kind of just exists in people's heads. A lot of the rules yeah. and regulations exist in people's people's heads. And a lot of the questions that people ask can be quite kind of specific and long tail and specific to their situation and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of that data doesn't really always exist in places, does it? A lot of that content and stuff doesn't really exist all the time. Yeah. It's trapped in people's heads or in, in various documents and stuff like that. So that must have been a bit of a challenge trying to assemble one is the design but the design is nothing Mm -hmm. unless you've got the actual infrastructure to to cope with it so i wonder whether you know was rocket mortgages organized in that sense or was part of what you had to do there is to figure out how to you know start organizing the content and and how things are architected and stuff like that yeah that's a great question so i think rocket was better than a lot of traditional fintech companies that i've seen i think fintech um, as a whole, because it's so highly regulated, um, you know, is their their willingness to use like new software and new technology and even things like getting on the cloud um, is a little bit like it takes a little bit longer for them to do so. And because of that, a lot of a lot of the things that you can do with technology, you just can't do in the finance space. Um, Rocket was a little bit better than that. We did have we didn't have to re-architect too much. I would say the like there was two big challenges. Um, the first one is that with mortgages, um, it's so dependent on like personal situations. So the barrier to entry for people to use chatbots and actually get value from these things is so high. So for example, if you want a mortgage, I can't tell you anything without knowing what your credit score is in the United States. Um, So I can give you like a range with, hey, your interest rate might be like 2.5%, but I'm probably not going to do that because it 100% depends on your credit score, how much assets you have in the bank, um, which is really private information. And trying to convince somebody that they need to pull credit, um, you know, using a chatbot is incredibly scary, Um, especially because in the United States and with Rocket Mortgage as well, our um, user base skewed a little bit higher, so early 50s. um, And those are people that really... Um, at least like our experiences were that their their willingness to use like new technologies and trust new technologies like conversational products um, was a little bit lower than, you know, like the millennials and the Gen, Gen Z generations. Um, so that was definitely like a, a very interesting problem is being able to add value, but needing those personal like you know, um, data points before doing so and having to explain to people that like, hey, we can help you. We just need these really scary pieces of information first. Um, And then I would say that second thing is um, really similar to that is everyone's like mortgage journey and everyone's information differs so much based on so many different factors. Um, So for example, it's, it's tax season right now in the United States. Everyone hopefully finished filing their taxes on Monday. 
what you owe in taxes and how taxes work for different home properties depends on so many things. It depends on what state you're located in, the type of property you bought. If you bought like a single family home versus an investment property, how much you paid for that property. And then even stuff like if you have solar panels in your house, you're going to have a tax cut um, because the government kind of incentivizes things like that. Um, So being able to integrate with like a million different APIs to be able to actually help people and not just give people like status content, status content, um, static content, sorry, I tripped over that a few times, um, is, is, is a little bit tricky. And so um, there's a lot of technology that goes into building a chatbot that's meaningful. Um, it's not just like, you know, content that could like potentially help them. It has to be very, very contextual. Mm, interesting. I mean, yeah, on in the, in the finance industry, there's, I mean, talking about credit scores and stuff like that, you're looking at, yeah, getting data from a whole bunch of different places. How how much of what you were doing at Rocket Mortgages for those types of use, I'm presuming the chatbot was able to check credit scores and stuff like that. So we had our, um, it was, so we were able to pull credit, um, but we pull credit with a third party. Um, so that's kind of, so how it works is people consent to giving us their credit, like to us pulling their credit. And then we were able to automatically pull credit and then pull that like back into the experience to be like, okay, Kane, we checked your credit and we see it's about a 750. Here's what you qualify for. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So how much of, um, and maybe you could speak to this from all of the different kind of roles that you've, that you've had throughout your kind of conversational AI career, how much of what a conversation design does in your experience is purely focusing on just simply what the, ex- not simply, but purely focusing on what the experience is versus all of the requirements that are needed in order to fulfill it. Because it's pointless designing something that's, you know, really fancy yeah. and flashy and checking credit and all this kind of stuff if, if you can't actually deliver it. So where where does where does your role begin and end and where does this technical spec in and feature kind of like prioritization creep in yeah that's a great question um so i think there's like stages of building out our conversation and so and it's also like a a give and take so i would say that when we're when we're building out an entirely new experience um i like to look at ideal state like what could this look like if we have you know access to like every single data point and all of these APIs are open for us to use. And we have, you know, like engineers that are willing to work with us and have the time Um, and really like fleshing out what does that experience look like? And then obviously, you know, we all live in the real world. Unfortunately, things are not as simple as, you know, they are on paper. Um, And so scaling that back and seeing like, okay, what are the biggest value adds in this experience? And what are the things that, you know, we have to have in order to ship? What are some of the things that are nice to have? And then what are some of the things that could be a V2 or we need a lot more, you know, like data engineers or software engineers in order to get. Um, And so sometimes the ideal experience is not what gets shipped. Oftentimes the ideal experience is not what gets shipped, but I think it's really important to design for that ideal experience as well um, so that you kind of have like a vision that you're working towards. Mm, yeah <clears throat> that's good practice and that's that's very um very akin to the the traditional kind of service design methodology like in an ideal world how should this thing work ideally and then what do we actually have today that we can actually deliver and kind of work mm-hmm. back from that like what what are the must have fundamentals that without yes. which this whole thing falls down what are the should mm-hmm. have things that we think were really important and will make the experience but not critical and then what other could have things that are kind of the bells and whistles and stuff like that? Is that the kind of mm-hmm. the typical approach? Yeah, that was exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, interesting. So so Instacart, what are the kind of current use cases and, and channels and stuff like that that, that Instacart is, is utilizing from a conversational point of view? Yeah. Um, so we have a bunch of different things going on. I can talk about the things that are currently live. Um, we have two versions of a chatbot for two um, different customer bases. Um, so Instacart has a lot of different like users that use Instacart for various reasons. We have retailers, um, we have shoppers, and we have customers. And right now we're live. Um, we have a live chatbot for both shoppers and customers that are very different. Um, so in the shopping world, it's um, more like help and support. 
So shoppers that are, you know, like checking. So for example, say like you place a grocery order with us, we're going to have a shopper go out and actually like pick stuff out for you. And they might have questions throughout the process. Um, for example, their credit card might decline for whatever reason, or they get to your address and it's an apartment and you haven't left an apartment number, you just left the complex, um, things like that. They can contact the chatbot and we'd be able to very quickly help them. And um, either with like content or with actually like automa API automations that we have built in so that we can very quickly like answer their questions. Um, on the customer side, um, there's, you want to add to your grocery order, your shopper has started shopping and you're realizing that, hey, they're picking up some of the wrong things or, you know, they've made an exchange of, let's say like French fries for sweet potato fries and you hate sweet potatoes. Um, we'll be able to help with things like that. Interesting. So talk, talk us through that kind of customer journey then. So are people able to actually see the shopper going around and picking up things as you go along Am yes, I that we right? think that's, yeah we actually think that's core to our business because we don't want shopping to be like a black box um so essentially what would happen is you place an order through the app and uh, schedule a delivery time and we let you know when your shopper begins shopping so you <laughs> get like a little app alert um and you're able to see them in real time pick things out so for example if you did order those potatoes um or those french fries, you can set a replacement in case something goes out of stock. Huge problem in the United States with COVID, almost everything is out of stock. Everything good is out of stock. Um, and if you know they're not able to find your particular potato brand, your french fry brand, and they find a different one, they can ask you like, hey, is this okay? And you can approve or deny it. Or you can say, hey, it's up to the shopper. Like, I don't have the time to like, you know, watch them shop, let them pick whatever like replacement they want or refund me. If you can't find the specific item, just give me the money back and keep going. Um, obviously with all of those different options, people still have like support questions and that's really where the chatbot comes in. Right, interesting. I didn't realize that was the case. So. Yeah. So it's predominantly, on the customer side, the use case is predominantly customer support. On the, cust on the shopper side, it's, it's for, the, for the moments where they're actually doing the picking of the shopping and also is the shopper the same person that actually does the delivery as well? Yeah, so it's, it's shopper support. It's end-to-end -end shopper support. So there's, there's so many different things that unfortunately could go wrong. You, your hours could change in the grocery store. That happens all the time um, with, with COVID, with just like grocery stores, you know, hours change. You might get there and realize that they're not open. We would help you out with that. Um, a customer could cancel their order or change their delivery address. Um, the layout of the store could have changed. Um, and you can't really find anything. Um, we provide our shoppers with credit cards where we load the right amount of money on there. And every now and then, suppose you, you, you watch your shopper shopping and you realize you really need laundry detergent and you completely forgot. Um, you would be, you would say, you would tell them, hey, can you also pick up laundry detergent? Um, our bot would be able to add to their card, like their credit card, so that they would be able to successfully check out and not have like a, a bounce back because, you know, the initial amount is more than the estimated amount or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then with delivery, um, delivery addresses are sometimes an issue. So being able to support shoppers through the entire experience up until they get paid. Interesting. This, I'm starting to get the grips of it here. So that's interesting. That so, so Instacart essentially employs shoppers to go into the stores and actually do the shopping and pay for the shopping in the stores. Interesting. So what it is in the UK, the similar services, what they do is actually the retailer itself will integrate into the um, platform. And so the finances, basically, they'll go through what would be the Instacart or the delivery or whatever, but then they'll be passed on to the, to the retailer. In this mm -hmm. instance, the finances go to Instacart. Instacart gives it some of that finance to the shopper who then goes yeah. to the shop to pay for it. Interesting. Yeah, that's exactly right. We do have a retailer option as well, um, but primarily our business is customer to shopper. Right. That is really interesting. That because that means that you can then you can then scale into different types of shopping very quickly, can't you? Because you're not reliant on onboarding retailers. 
Yes, that was actually the reason we did it this way. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Trader Joe's at all. I've heard of Trader Joe's, but I'm not familiar okay. exactly with how it works and stuff. Okay, so Trader Joe's is one of those like insane business models that's not on the internet at all. Um, and it, they almost have like a cult-like following. They're incredible. Um, it's it's I would say it's like a Whole Foods competitor, um, right. but a lot better. And they come out with their own products. Everything that they stock is like Trader Joe brands. So they buy directly from suppliers. They stock only Trader Joe brands and um, absolutely delicious, but they don't have an online catalog. They don't even do like email marketing. They don't do sales. It's just you visit their store and you get what you need and you leave. And it's it's a very, it's a very interesting business model um, and it works very, very well for them. Um, and one of the, the biggest things, like it's a huge millennial brand, um, huge Gen Z brand as well. And with... Um, people want to shop at Trader Joe's and you never know what's in stock and what's out of stock until you get there. And it's very, very busy all of the time. Um, so the way that Instacart was actually founded was our co-founders went into Trader Joe's and took pictures of every single product and actually created their catalog themselves. And people were ordering, this was in San Francisco, uh, where obviously, you know, not a lot of people have cars. You're kind of like holding your grocery bags and getting on the BART, which is like the public transportation. And it's all very messy and all very difficult. Um, people were ordering through Instacart and we would actually have our co-founders go into the stores and shop for them. Um, and we, and then very quickly started scaling to different grocery stores. And so what's really nice about it is in a lot of areas, like regionally in the United States, there's like very popular grocery stores. So for example, like my favorite grocery store is um, like a mom and pop shop, like down the street. Um, I absolutely love it. I don't shop at big like retailers and they're it's very easy for them to get on instacart they have to do very little and it's very easy for a shopper that's shopping at those bigger grocery stores to also just swing by my mom and pop shop pick up what i need and get it to me interesting that is really good that is mm -hmm. a business model that would work pretty well over here as well actually i think um because yeah you're not reliant on on board and the retailers you can just basically have someone go to wherever <laughs> wherever you want to go to and, and pick some stuff up that's wicked so so from from the conversational automation side of things and most kind of like most established organizations that are trying to utilize this technology um obviously there's lots of different reasons that they would that they would utilize it lots of different reasons that they would explore it but one of the large kind of trends is around customer support customer service stuff like that yeah. and it's usually that they're trying to you know deflect contact for more expensive channels like call centers yeah. and stuff like that um yeah. or they're trying to improve the conversion rate of the website so you know to increase revenue yeah. or whatever instacart though sounds as though it's well and truly a digital native company it was built on the internet it is fundamentally yeah. a technology company yep. was the aim of this initiative similar to what most other organizations would have an aim in in terms of trying to reduce customer support costs and things like that or was it always kind of there from the beginning as a way of part of the customer experience for the shopper and for the customer like wondering with you i know you've only been there since february but yeah, no. in terms of the history of why so, it, where it came from yeah so the conversation ai um department at instacart or even the strategy at instacart is actually very very new um it started in november um, so I've actually been a around for a lot of it, which is funny because I'm very new as well. <laughs> um, and it was very much um, created in order to um, really like save money um, in terms of customer support um, and a large part due to COVID because obviously COVID just like changed our business model and changed how we do things tremendously. Um, with the rise of COVID, more and more people were placing online deliveries and Instacart saw like a, a huge amount of people who are not only um, like relying on us for their groceries weekly or even daily, um, but people who wanted to shop, like use our app to be, become shoppers um, because the idea of, you know, having that income that's um, kind of dependent on their own like time and their own workload was very attractive to a lot of people in the United States. Um, and so our customer support times and our shopper support times just went through the roof in terms of call volumes. Um, and from a monetary ROI standpoint, having someone on the phone and having someone, you know, like available to help on a phone is a lot more expensive than a chatbot. And so that's really how the conversational AI program started at Instacart was an A-B test where we um, 
launched a chatbot that was able to help in a couple different use cases. And we were like, how much of the call center volume can we deflect um, into this new strategy? And how much of like, how much money will that save us? And it was ROI positive almost immediately. And that was without any, like any, I'm not going to say any thought, but a whole lot of thought and strategy. It was just a very, very simple, like MVP, A-B test. Um, you know, six months later, and we're still seeing positive ROI um, with every single automation that we do. And I think that's really changed the mentality of what we're trying to do with conversational AI. Um, when I got to Instacart, we were all about like automations and being able to deflect volume from call centers. And I think automations are obviously great. Um, but when you look at the principle of conversational AI, it's about speed, efficiency, personalization. And when you apply that to the, the Instacart model and really to like tech companies everywhere or just like companies everywhere, efficiency and optimization and personalization are things that everyone's kind of attracted by and everyone needs. Um, and so I think when we think of what we can do with conversational AI moving forward, um, our scope is not only call centers and support centers, but it's also being able to really influence like different areas of the app um, and using those principles of conversational AI to um, just like move our business forward and into like, obviously we're in the 21st century, but even like just making us more modern and more, um, more like in line with what our users want, I guess. Mm, yeah, bringing it, bringing it from support into core kind of, um a, a core modality basically you know for shoppers to be able Precisely. to find products and all that kind of stuff the the, oh, the whole shopping journey mm, interesting um so what does it kind of look like as far as so instacart you mentioned over covid began obviously growing because a lot more mm-hmm. shoppers are wanting to use the service can't leave the houses things like that a lot more uh when i say shoppers i mean customers than the actual the shoppers want to kind of mm-hmm. you know out of work furloughed whatever it might be might be laid off trying to trying to kind of like find jobs and stuff like that what yeah. kind of demand does instacart typically see from its customer support like i'm presuming it's must be a fairly you know fairly high volume part of the business yeah And that's the interesting thing about customer support is it varies so much and there's spikes and dips. Um, So it's very, very hard to predict. Um, For example, Easter, like Friday was insane. We saw three times the amount of call volumes than we do on a typical Friday. Um, And that's again, like why I think conversational AI is so great is that it's, it is scalable with those, you know, like large spikes and like dips. Um, so it's really, it's really hard for me to put like a tangible number behind like our call volume and our chat volume. Um, it's in the, the 20,000s every day. And then every now and then it just like shoots up and you look at the graph and you're like, oh, I wonder what happened that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and what kind of use case, so you've kind of covered some of the use cases, but in terms of the scope of, you mentioned there that when you started, you were kind of, it was like an experiment, an MVP, let's see if we can do it, you know, presumably some of the high volume, low complexity kind of use cases, see if it sticks. And it started to stick out of this kind of scope and breadth of, I know you were talking about putting it elsewhere in the customer journey and elsewhere throughout the different channels and stuff, but thinking just about where it began on the customer support side, out of the whole breadth of use cases that that exist, what how how much of that do you think is covered within the the chat experience as it stands? That is a very good question. So our like North Star for customer support is anything that an agent could do on the phone, the chatbot should be able to do. Um, and I would say we're about 40 to 50% there. Um, and like you kind of talked about in the beginning of this conversation, um, having the tech and the API support and all of that for being able to do everything just doesn't exist yet. And that's why it's a little bit, it takes a little bit more time. Um, and then we also have fallback methods in our support options right now, where, for example, if you come into our chatbot and you say like, I need help with X, Y, and Z, and we don't cover that yet, we default to help articles um, because we have a content team that writes help articles for our shoppers um, and our customers as well. Um, 
And that's a little bit more manual. It's not a wonderful experience, but it does get the job done in the sense that you can then read an article that tells you exactly what you need to do if you need to, um, for example, you're shopping and you've had some sort of emergency and you can no longer complete the order. Um, you would manually go through it and be able to manually go through that article and be able to help yourself out. Um, so the chatbot does link to all of those different things. Um, but in terms of like being able to do things within the chatbot itself in that ecosystem, it's about 40%, I would say. Mm, interesting. So you began in November 2021, was it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you started in February 2022. And it's yes, now April. So that's November, mm -hmm. December, January, February, March. It's so a six month and you're managed yes. to, managing to cover 40% of use cases. That's pretty quick going, that. Yeah, no, for sure. And I will say one of the, the most interesting things, and I think this is a pretty common UX principle, the whole like, um, is it, I always get the percentages confused, but it's like 80% of um, the things that are used are by like 20% of the product. Mm -hmm. um, I probably worded that very incorrectly. Yeah. but 80% um, <laughs> yeah, of, of customers use 20% of the features. Yes, much yeah. better than the way I said it. <laughs> um, and that's, that is very much true. And I think it's so interesting in like the customer support world because you'll look at the heavy hitters and they're just astronomically big compared to some of the things that are a little bit smaller. So like one use case for us was like 25% 20 of call volume. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Interesting. So is, is that the was that the trick would you say not trick but is that is that the thing that's expedited a lot of this is that you were going for the really big hitter use cases or was there anything else that you think has contributed to moving at a relative pace with this stuff yeah so we started out really intentional with what we start like where we really started with and that's because um obviously this was new and we didn't have that stakeholder upper management you know full buy-in quite yet because it was such a new technology and it was such a new initiative. Um, so we really did start with figuring out what are our highest call, um, what are the reasons why people contact support the most, um, how much money can we save if we deflect, and let's let's do that. Um, and so really making that like ROI case, like that business case. Um, now we have, we still continue to do that, but we also look at um, other metrics. So one of them that is really important for CSAP, customer satisfaction scores. So if we have a specific automation and the CSAT is super low, we're getting a lot of complaints about it, we'll look into it um, sooner than we might look into something else. Um, but our two, our two KPIs that we look at are um, self-service rate, how, 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 what's the rate that the user was able to go through this flow and actually completely self-service? Um, and then what's the customer satisfaction store that they gave us after they were done with the experience? Hmm, interesting so how how do you monitor is there something specific you're looking for when you're trying to find the self-service rate do you monitor like a the the final intent in a conversation or have you got like a, a bunch of intents that you've identified as okay when these ones are hit that's the end kind of thing or is it something you get from a line of business system when something's been happened something's happened on the back end like how how do you quantify that it's a very good question. So it is a combination of things. So the first one, like you said, are those intents. Um, so if you hit like a thank you intent, or if you hit a specific area in the flow, um, or you've given us feedback, like, did this help you? Yes, it did. No, it didn't. And you said yes. Um, we're signifying that as we helped you. Self-service rate is complete. Um, but obviously not everyone gives feedback. Um, so there is there are a large number of users that, that get to like an area where we gave them the information that they would need to self-service, but we have no, we didn't get any feedback on if it was actually helpful for them or not. Um, and that's super, super tricky. And the way that we really measure that is in a few different ways. Um, we look at were they, did they successfully do the thing that they set out to do? So if it was a shopper, did they deliver that order? Was that order delivered? Was that order delivered on time? And what was the rating that shopper got from that customer? Because similar to all of the apps we've talked about, you know, a, a customer can rate a shopper like five stars or four stars. Um, and we look at those to kind of signify, okay, if they if they got to a point in the in the experience where we gave them the information that they needed, and were able to see throughout the whole user journey that they successfully did the thing that they wanted to do, then we're marking that as success. Um, similarly, we. Um, one of the most, one of the coolest things I find about Instacart is all of our data is very connected. So we're able to um, 
really quickly kind of like see how the chatbot and how our voice assistants affect the rest of our systems. So one of those systems is our support system um, and our ticketing system. So um, if you're a shopper or let's say you're, yeah, you're a shopper with Instacart um, and you go through the chatbot and we don't help you and you get to an agent, immediately a ticket would be created for you. Even before you get to that agent, our chatbot has created a ticket and then assigned it to that agent. So they can very quickly work on your case. And when they're done, close that ticket. If you don't have a ticket created, it means that your problem was most probably solved. And so if you go through our experience, you get to a content block um, or you know a piece of information that we think signifies that we've helped you um, and you don't go on to create a ticket with us. Um, and that means that you don't call us you don't, you know, like text us on a different line because we would be able to track all of that. Um, then we mark that as success and that contributes to our self-service rate. Interesting. That's very sophisticated. That's really good. Mm -hmm. I love that, the the whole kind of way that ties together in terms of tickets raised and the tickets open when the agent gets to it and then it can be closed there and then, which is, yeah. you know, that's that's really good that because half most of the time most organizations that have any any level of support you know a ticket raised it sits there for five minutes it's then it sits there yeah. for two days three days someone eventually gets around to it and it's like yeah it all just sits in limbo whereas just yeah i'm in the agent with the context of the conversation mm -hmm. getting resolution and then closing it off in the space of one conversation is wicked yeah yeah and i think it's it's really nice that the the handoff is very seamless and that the customer support team and the chatbot team have the same goals and that we're working very closely together. And I think um, the, the user journey is very seamless because of that. Um, even if you were to, for example, like get frustrated with our chatbot and, you know, like close it and call in, we would have that information and we would know that, okay, you chose to go the phone route um, and we would work to make sure that in the future that doesn't happen and we're able to help you in like the, the channel that you originally chose. Mm, interesting and do you have that kind of agent escalation on the customer side as well or is that purely on the shopper side yeah that's a good question so we started with shopper we're rolling out to customers so these are things that exist um maybe don't exist right now but will exist in like 24 hours 48 hours a week a month um, we're rolling out very quickly we're actually rolling out something this afternoon which is very exciting mm -hmm. um so it they might not exist to the same um, sophistication as they do with Shopper, um, but our plan is to get them there as soon as possible. Mm, interesting, interesting. That's wicked. Um, so, so you've got two examples in the chat channel, and you mentioned before your experience with voice and beginning with Alexa skills and stuff like that. Does Instacart mm -hmm. do anything on on the voice channel as well, either the voice assistants or call center calls and stuff like that? Yeah, so we do have um, a call center and we do have something that we call Shopper Voice, um, where shoppers who are interested in um, being connected to a live agent can do so. Um, we're actually exploring um, like the voice assistant capabilities there. Um, it is a little bit complicated because of Canada. Um, so I actually didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago. Um, Quebec has laws with uh, the French language. So any support that's launched in English also has to be launched in French in French, um, which is delaying us a little bit because um, we've never done anything with um, different languages just because we're primarily in the United States. Um, and so that is something that we're, that's an obstacle that we're currently overcoming. And um, pretty soon we will have a voice channel. Nice, nice. Yeah. Translation does cause some, uh, some complications, definitely, especially with you know entities and stuff like that whereas yeah in, in one language you know the whole kind of use of entities in languages is, is entirely different potentially um which gets quite yeah. complex um yes, sure. cool so, so what is the what is the sort of like what does the makeup look like over there when you started what was the current sort of like capabilities as far as you know staff skills roles that kind of stuff and then and what does it kind of look like now like who is it that's actually doing all of this yeah. stuff it sounds as though you must have a decent team if you're moving it sounds yeah. like you're moving very quickly so you must have you must have quite a few different skill sets and stuff like that yeah our team is absolutely fantastic um so when i started um we were inside of content strategy um which is a very interesting place to be um and we had essentially um started with content writers who specialized in writing content for the um, for support channels. Um, 
that were interested in getting started with chatbots and seeing really what they could do there. And that's kind of how our experimentation phase started. Um, our team right now um, is very, is incredibly diverse in skill sets. I think um, one of, we have a mix of technical people and a, and a mix of people that have um, linguistic backgrounds, psychology backgrounds, um, customer service backgrounds, backgrounds, which is really cool. And then like writing content, um, some people that are really interested in like poetry, um, which I think is absolutely fantastic for like bot writing and persona writing and all of that stuff. Um, and then um, a lot of people that are incredibly, incredibly data literate. Um, so like data scientists, data analysts, um, which is all such good skill sets to have on a team. And I think that is one of my favorite things about conversational AI is that um, it requires so many different skill sets. Um, it's not just like it has a, a product component and has a UX design component, a um, like a front end component. And um, it's, it's really cool because I really feel like it's that one place in tech where like every like anyone can kind of like contribute. And there's like there's things that like any skill set can really like bring to the table. Mm, it is and conversation designers come from all kinds of places don't they you know i know quite yeah. a few conversation designers who've come from like a poetry background or a playwright background yeah. or something like that writing background but then you've got a lot of user experience designers and stuff like that that are kind of that get interested in it um i actually think that it's not from the dialogue crafting side of things but from the architecture side of things that business analysts actually make good conversation yeah. designers because they're used to having you know they're used to talking to people anyway because that's kind of what they spend a lot of time doing is talking to different parts of the business they, they have a good yeah. understanding of different parts of the business and also really good at understanding how to take something from one place and wind it through yeah. various complications to get it to an end point you know um but yeah lots yeah. of different lots of different skill sets which is interesting um you touched on something there around um you know personality design and and things like that um how was what was your approach to that was there a per, does the instacart bots have a personality is it the same thing for both kind of bots does it differ for the shopper and the customer like what was your approach to to the whole yeah. personality design side of things yeah that's a great question i love persona design it's one of my favorite parts of the job um in terms of instacart we're actually currently drafting a persona um and we actually just launched a new brand identity like a couple of weeks ago. And so we were kind of waiting on that in order to really help like define our persona because I think it's incredibly important to be consistent with your brand identity, like your bot persona and your brand identity should be incredibly consistent or that just leads to confusion. Um, and so really waiting on that was really important. Um, I think it's interesting because we have at Instacart various different kinds of users, but sometimes the users do overlap. So it's not uncommon for a shopper to also be a customer and a customer to try, you know, to be a shopper. Um, and just like Uber has two completely separate apps. So they have like an app for drivers and an app for customers um, that use the, use Uber. Um, we also have two different apps. So we're very distinct. Um, and that's something that we're very intentionally thinking about when it comes to our personas is do we really want two personas or do we want like a single persona for those people that, you know, switch between the two, two user groups? And that's something that we, we haven't answered yet. Um, but I will say with my, with all of the personas that I've crafted in the past, um, my like biggest, I know you didn't ask for my advice, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. <laughs> um, my, like my absolute biggest advice is to like base personas off like a real person or, not a real person, but like a person or two people. Um, and that means like take personality tests for your bot. That's one of the things that I loved doing when I was at Rocket. Um, I actually based our Rocket mortgage persona off of Sophie Turner, who plays um, Sansa Stark in Game of Thrones, not Sansa Stark, very intentionally Sophie Turner. Um, partially because it required me to say that me watching Sophie Turner interviews on YouTube was part of my job, but also <laughs> mostly because her personality and her persona that she really reflected of being, you know, incredibly confident and incredibly like welcoming and warm was really aligned with um, what I think that Rocket needed at the time, especially with the conversational um, AI experiences is having that open, friendly um, persona. And so I think it's very similar that we're going to be doing very similar things to Instacart, but being very intentional to really align with our new brand identity. Mm, interesting. Um, what's your kind of approach to doing that? If, if I mean, when you design a conversation, 
you can't help but create a persona anyway, even if it's subconscious, can you? Every single line of dialogue you write, especially is also if it's spoken, you've got to actually consciously select a voice to read that content back. Um, yeah. And even if you don't, you're still presenting kind of language back to a user and, and people can make all kinds of assumptions about that word do you use correct grammar do you use slang do you you know yeah. use emojis and stuff like that so what are your kind of i suppose two questions and maybe it's, maybe it's the same question but kind of like any advice on the kind of things to consider when creating a pers personality or persona and secondly how do you make sure that dialogue that is written conforms to that persona so maybe we'll start with the first one in yeah. terms of any tips that you have around what are the kind of things to consider uh, what should be included in a persona yeah. in a good persona design um that is a great question i think being very cognizant of who your user group is is the first thing i think it's impossible to design a persona without knowing who you're designing that persona for so just knowing who you're talking to, who your audience is. And it, it really does differ. At Rocket, our audience were um, most like people that were looking to buy a home or refinance a house, which were people in their late 40s, early 50s for refinance and even went up to 60s and 70s. Um, at Instacart, the majority of people that are um, customers are actually women um, and millennial women. Um, and so being very cognizant of knowing like who your audience is, I think is really, really important in the first big step of persona design. Um, I think um, a voice and tone guide for a persona design is critical. And that really kind of answers that second question is, um, how do you make sure that your content and the stuff that you're actually presenting is in line with your persona? Um, having guidelines. And that's not to say like, you know, there's no creativity allowed in the, in the conversational design process, but really having like guardrails that help you kind of foster that creativity while being um, consistent with what you want to say. Um, and some of those guidelines, like one of the, the biggest guidelines for me, that's a very simple thing, but like using acronyms when you're, when you're writing, um, is one, is it acronyms? It's not acronyms. It's contractions. I'm sorry. Using yeah. contractions and not using acronyms. Um, I saw your face go like this for a second. I was like, no, I said something like this. <laughs> um, but yes, using, using contractions. I see so many people, especially with like when, um, it's like a, a voice assistant and you hear like, do not instead of don't it just sounds robotic um mm. and so that was one of the the tiny tweaks that i made when i was at rocket that really helped us um i would say other aspects of um like per, like what makes a good persona is having like guiding principles um so there's principles of like conversation design like the cooperator principle the maximum of relevance of quantity all of that stuff um those principles are really important and they're kind of almost like a checklist that you can go back and like um, kind of check your content against. So one of the things I see with a lot of conversation design um, designers is that they over explain. Um, and sometimes it comes off as like, they're almost like, they're not really putting the user in the center of the conversation. And they're kind of like pushing way too much information onto the user, like it's not relevant. And sometimes when you over explain, it makes the user feel dumb it makes them think that you will, you know, like, so something as simple as to sign in, please go to our sign in button, click the button, type your username and your password. Like, if someone said that to me, I would immediately be like, do you think I'm stupid? Like, you're, <laughs> you don't need to say all of that. And from a cognitive load perspective, right? It's so hard to remember all of that. Um, so having those principles um, in your writing, like, um, the principle or the maximum of like relevance is like we will only present things that are relevant to you at that time um, and then actually checking your your content through that and saying okay are we are we meeting these certain principles um, and if it's a yes like let's move forward mm. it's interesting that one because I think people can get so caught up in like dwelling over a particular turn in a conversation to the point where you actually completely forget that yeah. this one turn in a conversation is going to be over in a split second. It's yeah. like the interaction so fast that like, and I'm not saying it doesn't need to be deliberated because I think it does if you're going to have the conversation yeah. move to the next turn, but there's so much temptation to dwell on a turn, which then encourages that, which is over elaboration, including something that could easily be an answer to a follow-up question. If it's relevant, if the user decides to ask it or like, you yeah. know, just, trying to make sure that every possible thing that's needed 
is included in mm-hmm. the response. So half of what you were saying there yeah. is actually just typical kind of like content design best practice. In, a, in, in I know it's like Grice's maxims, which is most of those principles, but yeah, typical content kind of design is all about that relevant, you know, the inverted pyramid, mm-hmm. put the conclusion at the top, you know, yeah. leave the details to later. All of that yep. kind of stuff is still just as relevant here, isn't it? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think um, the added complexity is especially with, um, well, with chatbots, it's that it's the less the less amount of real estate, right? Um, because you know you have to be even more intentional with your content because just the the space you're working with is usually less. Like it's not an entire you know like UI. And with voice assistants, it's the tone. Um, and I think that's something that people don't realize is like they write out their content and they don't necessarily listen to their content, but having the pauses in the right area. Um, I remember when I was at Rocket, there was a um, a voice. I guess like a, a, a voice IVR, like a intelligent I, IVR isn't intelligent, but a more intelligent IVR um, that was starting off with, are you looking to buy a home or refinance? And it sounded like a yes or no question. Yeah. And so I would respond with yes or no. And in fact, it was the, the prompt was waiting for one of those two, like buy a home or refinance. Um, and so being like listening to your content, I think is also very important. Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> and having it in context as well, like, a lot of the time, even when you listen back to it, if you're not in the context of the conversation, if you haven't gone from a few turns back and got to that point so that you're experiencing it in real time, I think you can also <laughs> overlook things as well. You know, you've got to really kind of like, which is why I think testing of these things is so difficult, you know, Absolutely. because you, yeah. you need to really kind of like to properly design something well, you can't just, yeah. go, oh, let's just test that one response. And you kind of got to go through the whole process. Um, yeah. which is different from the kind of unit testing and, and some of the kind of like technical testing, even just from an experience yeah. point of view, you've got yeah. to go through every twist and turn to make sure that every point yeah. of the conversation is contextually relevant, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, testing is, is super, super interesting with these things. And I think um, there's always bias in testing as well, um, especially for the people that are designing because they're so used to talking to the, the experience in a certain way that they don't realize that there's various different ways that people communicate. Um, and so I think with testing, we always leave things open to like UAT testing where we have um, at Rocket, it was like business partners and anyone that was able and willing to help us come in and like play around with the bot and just seeing the different ways that people interact with it. And depending on, you know, like their age demographic, where they grew up in the United States or outside of the United States um, and kind of their experiences previously with bots and that historical, you know, like experience that they're bringing in is really interesting. Um, and I think like as a perfectionist, one of the things that I had to like really come to terms with is that you can test as much as possible, but someone's going to say something that trips your bot up. Mm-hmm. Um, so really like monitoring and evolving bots. And I think that's why it's so important to, you know, consistently like um, look, like analyze your data and add to the entities and add to the intents and um, really pick a tool that allows you to kind of make those continuous improvements um, is so important. Mm, interesting. Um it kind of it, it's straying into into kind of like all oh, this process we've been talking about, which is, you know, crafting a personality and a persona that then gives consistency to the experience. It then aligns the team that's creating the thing. Uh, then on to testing of the end-to-end experience and stuff like that. There's obviously a process at play, and it sounds as though your process is very similar to what you would. I don't want to say a traditional conversation design experience because conversation design is still quite nascent, but it sounds as though yeah. you, it, it, it's all kind of familiar territory, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. but, but that process is fine and well when you've got you know, either a small team that's all on the same page or you know a process where you've been running it for, for, a, for a while. Whereas when you're kind of growing you're introducing new members yeah. into the team uh, or you're introducing new channels, which you have now, two different chatbots. So you've got two different types of things to design for, uh, two different types of use cases. Um, how do you approach that whole scale challenge where, you know, 
a group of people might be working on a bunch of use cases over here. An entirely different group might be working on a bunch of use cases over here. You've kind of got to align with the personality design, the, the, the kind of like approach to design, the way that you document and represent design artifacts, the way that you conduct testing all kind of needs to be consistent if you're going to produce that level of consistency on the front end. So wondering what your kind of um, conscious of time, I know we've only got a short while left, but any kind of advice you have on teams as they start to develop in their maturity and start to bring in new team members and start to scale their practice, what are some of the things that they should absolutely fundamentally do or not do? Yeah, that is a great question. Oh, my God. Um, I would say the one thing that I highly recommend are um, design crits and um, pair design. Um, both are things that we use here at Instacart, and I think they're so, so important. Um, so for pair design, um, very similar. I think it started with paired programming. So it's a mm -hmm. concept that's existed for a while. Um, but having two designers that might have completely different experiences um, work on a thing together. And I think um, I, I have heard some pushback from people around like, oh, it takes twice as long or like from an optimization standpoint, you know, we can put one designer on one thing and one designer on another and get twice the amount of work done. Um, I think like paired design is so important because things go fat, like things go faster. Um, and also some of those assumptions and questions are answered in the beginning instead of like further down the design process where it's like, oh, we forgot about this thing. Let's iterate here. Um, so I would say that's a really good way um, when you scale, that's a really good way to make sure you're consistent. Um, and then the second thing um, that we utilize are design crits. Um, and I actually, I believe that I got this idea from Figma um, that is a traditional, don't use, they don't use conversation design, they use traditional product design. Um, and they do weekly design crits um, where they have, you know, designers that are working on things that might not be ready to like be pushed to prod or be shown to even like product managers or anything like that. Um, kind of like walk through their process and like ask questions and really um, open it up to like use, like to other people to like, you know, to kind of like break it or tear it apart or even like in a nicer way, just like question some of the assumptions that they're making. Um, and I think having that feedback, like incorporating multiple feedback loops um, really helps things like stay consistent um, and just be like really great in terms of quality. Mm, definitely, especially with conversation design, because you're only ever designing one half of the conversation, aren't you, as a conversation designer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like the more time you dwell on designing that one half, uh the the more rework you're going to do later on when you eventually have a conversational partner to go through with um yeah. which yeah i think that the the earlier the feedback the better and i think that what is what it takes to have that kind of approach is a real kind of a, a real kind of solid culture you know i mean I've, I've run teams in the past where i've tried pair programming and on a programming side it was always quite mm -hmm. difficult to do because the team before when I took over were very much used to just working on their own and and yeah. the engineers I, I do my thing he does his thing we've got slightly different processes yeah. but we arrive there at the end and it almost yeah. felt as though well he's going to be watching what I'm doing and it's like you know I, I don't want to feel the pressure of kind of someone co I'm coding while they're looking over my shoulder and whatever so you kind of really got to break yeah. through that whole kind of personal um, anxiety yeah. that people have around their work being inspected and you know graphic design people tend to just in, in the graphic if you book on to design a poster you know you would design it to the point where it's polished and then you would present something you're happy with whereas this whole concept of presenting something yeah. that's an idea and discussing yeah. the idea quickly is quite yeah. alien to some people I don't know if you found that in your experience I I think you're you hit the nail on the head when you said it it 100% is about workplace culture. And I think having a culture at Instacart, we, we very much have a culture of collaboration over competition. Um, and that's kind of shown in like everything we do in our performance reviews, um, in the way that we promote people and all of that stuff. Um, and so I think having that culture is like almost requ like a requirement, like a prerequisite to being able to do something like pair design. Um, I have found like I, as the first conversation designer and the only conversation designer at Rocket for a very, very long time, um, I was kind of in my own silo, building out conversations, designing conversations. Um, and it's very difficult, or at least it was very difficult for me because I kind of had to be like a little bit cocky about it and be like, oh, I know like what the user wants. Like, you know, like I'm the subject matter expert here. And I really didn't have anyone to like bounce ideas off or even like anyone that would question like some of the assumptions I made. Um, and it was very slow in that sense because I would launch things, wait for, you know, 
us to get enough user feedback and then be like, oh, shit. Like, I completely forgot about that and, you know, evolve it that way. Um, whereas when I started building out that team at Rocket and we started having, you know, like five or six designers and I was able to, you know, get them in earlier into the process, um, we were really able to, like, kind of get those kinks out very early. And I found that in the end, it really led to, like, less, like, we'd monitor the process, but there was less, like, evolution and there was less, like, oh, we completely forgot this. Let's take it back to the drawing board. Um, but again, I, I do think it depends on... Um, kind of like people's mentality. And I, I 100% respect that some people, you know, prefer to work alone and do better alone. Um, and I think what's really nice about those design crits is like, they're optional. So if you feel like your work is ready um, to show people you can, and if you feel like you need some more time by yourself, um, that's okay too. And it also kind of shows people there are, I think there are a subset of designers that feel like they cannot show work till it's like really polished. Um, and being in a design crit and seeing some of like, quite frankly, the trash that I bring to design crit. And I'm like, what do you guys think about this? I think kind of empowers other people to feel like they can do the same. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the main, a really important thing is the fact that you can be a really good designer and not have it figured out, you know? And yeah. I think part of being a good designer is knowing when you can't figure something out and then doing what it takes to try and figure it out. And, and the best thing to do most of the time is two brains are always infinitely better than one brain or nine times out of 10, you know, two yeah. brains working on something are, are infinitely better. And so it's like, yeah, but it's interesting how, you know, the, I suppose the traditional design culture is, is less like that. And even, I suppose, you know, uh, this isn't from experience and this is just a complete assumption. So it could be completely wrong, but I would imagine that, copywriters might also have that kind of mentality because copywriters are used to crafting words you know every single word needs to fight yeah. for its place in every sentence which it does yeah um and so and and you can deliberate over words for quite a long time to make the perfect sentence and so i can imagine that the culture of copywriters coming into a role like conversation design which is a design practice which is all yeah. about prototyping and testing and iterating and all that kind yeah. of stuff might be a bit of a transition yeah, no, that's definitely a really interesting like point. I think I'm not a copywriter. I don't come from a copywriting background at all. The copywriters that I have seen that transition to conversation design, um, obviously I've only seen a few, so it's not like inconsistent of everyone, um, have always felt like there's something missing in the copywriting world. And I think sometimes it's that imposter syndrome where they're like, I'm in charge of crafting every word and how do I know that this word is superior to that word? And sometimes, you know, it's just a gut feeling or it's just like you just have to go with one. And so I think when we introduce them to things like, you know, rapid prototyping, A-B testing, all of those things, and it's very data driven and science banked, uh, uh, science backed. Um, they're almost like, oh, that makes sense. And I think it's I, I haven't seen it in a negative light just yet. And I hope I don't get in a negative place mm, good good well this yeah. is wicked this is really really good stuff maybe it's the final question maybe it's briefly i know a little bit over if we can wrap up with a quick fire final question which is yeah. what is maybe either the the kind of mistakes or or blunders that you see either that you might have been a part of when you first started or that you notice happening with new designers and how can they fix it what are some of the biggest mistakes people make and, and what should they do instead oh great question i think not a b testing i think assuming that something is going to bring value to your users um without really testing that assumption and i'm all about a b testing multivariate testing which is essentially having a control um so for example if you have a bot having the bot in production and then having a, a version of the bot with what you think could be improved and actually testing that against um like success metrics and actually setting success metrics before you launch is another big one. Um, I think a lot of designers um, don't like, they don't know what success looks like because they're not used to thinking in that business way. So they're like, oh, this is better. And it's like, okay, well, how is it better? How are you gonna like, how are you gonna prove it? Is, are there ways of measuring it? Um, and are you actually going to be able to prove it? Um, so that A-B testing and then the, the success metrics, um, I think are two things that are, um, not necessarily mistakes, but things that people definitely should be cognizant of. 
Mm, nice one. That's very good. Very good. Cool. Well, Aisha, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been, yeah, an absolute pleasure. It's been so interesting as always. Um, and I've loved, yeah, loved listening to the journey, love hearing how it's going. And hopefully, you know, we can do it again uh, in a few months or so when, uh, when things have progressed still, when you're running a team of 50 conversation designers and uh, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, you can join us tomorrow uh, where we're going to be talking to Phil Jordan of HomeServe. And we're going to be talking about how HomeServe implemented Dialogflow in their call center to automate some of their customer support as well. So we'll probably be building on some of this content perhaps. Um, and yeah, it's going to be interesting. So please do tune in. Thank you, Aisha, again. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you all for tuning in.